Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in the EMA's Knowledge Series 2020. This is all part of our 25th anniversary celebration, and we will have a few more webinars, and you will be again asked to join us, and I hope they will be very useful to you. This afternoon, we'll be addressing the EMA's role in noise pollution management. But before I introduce our presenters, there are a few things I want to tell you about the platform that we're using this afternoon. Um, we are on Zoom and we are simultaneously going live on Facebook. The questions that will appear in the comments, the questions that you'll be posing in the comments on Facebook will be amalgamated with the chat box in Zoom. So after the presentations, we'll have the Q&A session. Unfortunately, we will not be having a question and answer live within the process of the presentation. And we urge you please to type your questions, comments in the chat box. At the end, of course, as I said before, we will have those questions answered. And we also have, and you will also have an opportunity to, um, for those questions that were not addressed during the session, you have an opportunity to send them to EMA webinars at ema.co.tt. EMA webinars, one word, EMA webinars at ema.co.tt. Just wanted to let you know as well that this session is being recorded and by tomorrow it should be on our website, um, www.ema.co.tt and there will be a link on that website to go onto our YouTube page which is simply Environmental Management Authority if you're searching for us on YouTube. So I will now like to introduce our presenters. Um, the first presenter is Nadia Tawari, who is a technical officer attached to the noise unit. She'll be immediately followed by Matthew Jardim, who is also a technical officer with the Emergency Response and Investigations Unit. And they will be presenting. We also have a resource person from the legal department, this is one of our legal officers, who will be able to identify any legal issues and maybe elaborate on some of the responses as well as interpret the law in a manner that would be easy, easily represented, represented to you. So um, without any further comments, I now introduce Nadia to begin her presentation. Thank you, Marcia, for that introduction. Uh, this afternoon, we will be looking at the EMA's role in noise pollution management. This presentation will be outlined as follows. We begin with an introduction. We explore the various permits within the EMA that deals with noise. We look at monitoring and enforcement. We look at external entities and our relationship with these entities. And finally, we look at some of your frequently asked questions. All right, my apologies there. So we begin with what is noise? Noise can be defined as unwanted or undesired sound. Um, a sound may be unwanted because it has one or more of these characteristics. It may be loud, unpleasant or annoying, intrusive or distracting. Noise pollution can be defined as unwanted, excessive or displeasing sound that disrupts the activities between the balance of human or animal life. This graphic gives you an idea of some of the typical sound levels. So conversation at a distance of one meter is around 60 decibels. A heavy truck at a distance of 50 meters can be between 80 and 90 decibels. A nightclub may be uh, emitting sound the decibels are 110, and a jet may be emitting sounds between 120 and 130 decibels. 
This slide gives you an idea of the noise-related legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. As we can see here, the noise pollution control rules is just one piece of legislation that's available to address issues of noise. Some other pieces of legislation include the Summary of Dentist Act, within which the TTPS has control. There's the Liquor Licensing Act, which the the Trinidad and Tobago Police, as well as the licensing committees, they have a role there. There's also the motor vehicles and road traffic regulations, which the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, as well as the licensing authority, has um, responsibility for. The EMA's legislation, the EMA is governed by the, EM, the Environmental Management Act. And from this primary legislation, we have two pieces of subsidiary legislation within which noise matters can be addressed. These are the noise pollution control rules and the certificate of environmental clearance rules. The noise pollution control rules or NPCR as we call it internally, uh, divides Trinidad and Tobago into three zones. You have zone one, which are industrial areas, Zone two, which are environmentally sensitive areas, which are those areas that have been designated under the environmentally sensitive areas rules. Uh, currently, there are three ESAs. They are the Arrigo Savannah, Matura National Park, and the River Swamp. Zone three are general areas, and this is essentially every other area not covered by zone one and zone two. The noise pollution control rules also set prescribed standards for each of these zones. These standards must be met at the property line of the property where the source of sound is located. This table summarizes the prescribed standards for the various zones. There are two limits um, for daytime. Daytime is considered between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m and nighttime, which is considered from 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. As we can see, general area, zone three, the daytime limit is 80 decibels and the nighttime limit is 65 decibels. The NPCR contains certain exemptions. These are activities which are exempted from the prescribed standards. Here we present some of these exemptions. The full list can be obtained from the noise pollution control rules. So some of these exemptions include sporting activities without the use of sound amplifying equipment for a maximum of five hours between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Construction activity when conducted on a construction site between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. of the same day, as well as religious activities without the use of sound amplifying equipment for a maximum of five hours between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. of the same day. The NPCR also contains an, a, permit, a permitting system, which is known as a noise variation. A noise variation is essentially a permit that allows the grantee to exceed the prescribed sound pressure levels for a specified duration. Characteristics of a noise variation include a maximum permissible level and relevant times. It is location specific, it is date specific, and it includes site specific conditions which are aimed at mitigating the impact of noise on the surrounding receptors. An example of such a condition will include the speaker arrangement, as well as any other condition that the EMA deems fit. A noise variation is required where a person anticipates that any activity that they are going to undertake will generate noise that will exceed the, the prescribed sound levels for that zone. That person is required to apply to the EMA for a noise variation. Some examples of events which may require noise variation include parties and fets, sports days in which sound amplifying equipment is used, and construction activity on a construction site occurring between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. These are just some examples. If you are unsure of whether or not your activity requires a noise variation, 
you can contact the EMA uh, for further information. The noise variation process begins with the placement of an EMA notice or public notice in the daily newspaper at least 35 days before the event. Now this notice is placed by the person who's making the application to the EMA. It's not placed by the EMA. When this notice appears, there's a public comment period during which noise related objections can be lodged. The application, completed application that is, must be submitted to the EMA at least 28 days prior to the event. If objections are received during the public comment period, the EMA engages both parties and applicants may be required to provide further mitigation measures aimed at reducing the impact of noise on the surrounding receptors. A noise variation application may be either issued or refused. We now look at the Certificate of Environmental Clearance Rules or CEC rules. So CEC is required if you are planning to establish, modify, the commission or abandon any of the 44 designated activities that are listed in the CEC designated, designated activities order. This, um, this piece of legislation is also available on the EMA's website and it lists all 44 designated activities as well as the descriptions for each of these designated activities. For facilities that were established prior to July 2001, which may fall under one of these designated activities, are not required to apply for a CC unless they intend to modify, expand, decommission, or abandon their facility. Important to note is that the issue of a CC for an activity does not affect the requirement to obtain approvals from any other agencies or entities as required by law before proceeding with the activity. So how do CECs, um, what is the, C the role of CECs in managing noise? CECs can contain conditions which are aimed at minimizing the impact of noise on the surrounding receptors. These conditions will apply to both construction as well as operation of the activity. Some examples of these conditions include development of a noise monitoring plan to measure the noise that is produced from activities, Siting of noisy equipment away from sensitive receptors, routine maintenance of equipment, or establishment of a noise buffer or barrier. These are just examples of conditions that can be incorporated into a CC. Um, the actual conditions would depend on the, the particular um, situation. The EMA maintains public registers for its permits. These are noise, CC, water, and air. This register is open to the public for viewing and contains permit applications and the determinations of these applications. It can be accessed at the EMA's Information Center, which is located at number 8 Elizabeth Street, Sinclair. Due to current COVID-19 restrictions, however, an appointment system is currently in effect. If you wish to view the public register, you can call the EMA to make an appointment. Monitoring of noise is guided by the noise pollution control rules. It requires, for the EMA to monitor noise, it requires measuring of the sound, and measurement of sound is done using a sound level or noise meter. It has to be measured for a period of at least 30 minutes. The noise has to be continuous, and it has to be measured at the property boundary of the source of noise or at the affected person. I will now hand you over to my colleague, Matthew Jardim, who would continue from there on. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to take you through the enforcement process as well as monitoring of uh, noise variations and the management of noise pollution. Um, so the process of enforcement uh, begins with a potential uh, breach of the prescribed standard of noise pollution of noise um, in a particular area. Uh, this could come in the form of either through a noise variation, a breach of a noise variation, or in, can, in situations where there is no noise variation for a particular activity. Uh, in that case, the noise variation uh, where the EMA prescribes standards above the, the uh, ambient standard, which is then uh, breached by an applicant. This is when the EMA decides to serve a notice of violation once the breach has been established. Uh, the notice of violation will invite the, the violator or the applicant to a representation meeting where they're able to give representation to the EMA. Um, and then that could either end up in a consent agreement with the EMA where a financial penalty is issued upon the, the violator or through uh, further legal action and through an administrative order. If the violator does not respond to the uh, notice of violation, uh, an administrative order could uh, be served on the violator as well. All right, so now we're gonna take you through the different types of noise in different uh, locations, as well as the types of legislation that can also help remedy those uh, noise issues. So in industrial areas, both heavy and light industrial areas, uh, the CEC rules as well as the NPCR will be the uh, primary legislation to deal with noise in those areas. CEC rules simply because of the nature of the activity itself, the industrial activity, uh, will likely fall under the CEC rules and they will need approval from the EMA for that activity to be established in the first place. Um, under construction, we have, uh, uh, as we, Nadi would have mentioned before, there's an exemption period between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Um, sorry, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., uh, this is where the ambient noise levels are, are not to be disturbed. So therefore, the NPCR will be relevant here. Uh, also through the CEC rules, a uh, number of, uh, of construction activities will require uh, EMA approval as well through the CEC rules. In locations where machinery, industrial equipment, uh, extractor fans, compressors, generators, in, usually found in welding shops, fabricated um, woodwork shops, auto mechanical garages, and auto body shops. There are a number of uh, remedies here. Uh, the common law remedies uh, through the law of nuisance uh, can be handled through the judiciary. Uh, both the NPCR as well as the CEC rules under the designated activities as well as the Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, the Town and Country Planning Act comes into play because the activities typically happen uh, in residential areas. Um, the Town and Country Planning Act does not allow these activities to take place in these types of areas. So they would really be the primary agency to deal with uh, zoning in that, in that instance. <clears throat> in the case of entertainment, um, nightclubs and bars and, and uh, other types of uh, entertainment activities. There are a number of different uh, licenses and, and legislation that could also govern and help to mitigate any impact from these types of activities. You have the Liquor Licenses Act when it comes to bars and, and, um, and events, theaters and dance halls act. Um, you have shops, hours opening shops act as well, which is also under the TTPS and as well as the licensing committee under the magistrate court system. The NPCR also comes into play um, due to the noise coming from uh, events from specified venues, uh, also the noise, uh, the common law remedies as well uh, under the law of nuisance, which is again through the judiciary. Noisy vehicles, loudspeakers, uh, as well as fireworks all fall under the TTPS, um, under different uh, aspects of their legislation, the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Regulations, uh, Summary of Offenses Act, um, also as you can see for fireworks, a firework permit is also required. <clears throat> so coordination between the uh, TTPS and the EMA. Rule 27 of the Noise Pollution Control Rules says that nothing in these rules affects the operation of the Summary of Offenses Act or the common law regarding nuisance. Uh, the TTPS and noise um, under Section 70 of the Summary of Offenses Act says any person who causes a nuisance to the public is liable for a fine up to $1,500 uh, or imprisonment for six months. 
According to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, the TTPS can make can take immediate action against noise. As such, you can contact your nearest police station for immediate relief. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the uh, Trinidad and Tobago Police Service website under their frequently asked questions. Uh, what it clearly says is that for a noise problem, uh, report a problem to your nearest police station. They are the first responders when it comes to noise. Uh, the EMA's action taken in regards to, with regards to noise is typically retroactive, meaning that uh, we, we take a look at uh, the event after it's happened, especially in a breach of a variation. We will investigate and then take retroactive action in the form of financial penalties or uh, legal action. The Environmental Police Unit uh, is made up of special reserve police officers assigned to the EMA by the Commissioner of Police. These are full active police officers. They're just assigned to the EMA for the function of uh, noise monitoring as well as other, other functions under the EMA. Uh, they prosecute offenses under the Environmental Management Act, Chapter 3505, uh, and a subsidiary legislation. Here's a look at what the EMA can treat with versus what we cannot treat with. Uh, first of all, what we can treat with, uh, loud music from a specified venue. Um, as your fets, uh, any kinds of parties, nightclubs, uh, bars, these specified venues where it's a, a st um, standard location. Uh, noise from auto body garages, welling shops and sawmills, as well as woodworking shops, uh, those will fall under the CEC rules. So noise from those activities can be managed under the CEC rules. All of these activities fall under one of the 44 designated activities. Uh, noise from industrial activity, including plants and machinery, compressors, pumps, and AC units, also fall under the CEC rules, as well as also they have prescribed noise levels uh, in industrial areas as well. What the EMA cannot treat with, uh, loud music from mobile sources in motion, including vehicles with modified sound systems, loudspeakers, and music trucks. These would be the types of trucks that uh, have notices being uh, bl blared out on a loudspeaker. Mobile sources are not assigned to any specified venue. Uh, also, we look at instantaneous sources uh, during and uh, after discharge. This is not something that you could deal with. This is an example of fireworks and explosives. Also, noise from animals, barking dogs, farm animals, and also parrots. That does not fall within the EMA's jurisdiction either. We look at some frequently asked questions. Uh, who can I contact for immediate relief from noise? The initial response should be to contact the nearest police station, police post. They will do, um, they, they have more power in conducting an initial investigation um, for immediate relief. What can I do if I'm affected by noise from a welding shop? You could submit a complaint to the EMA through the complaints hotline, through the EMA's website. Uh, we will get into those, uh, those different methods of complaints uh, just in a, in a few moments. <clears throat> Noise variation has been issued for an event in my area, but I am being affected by the noise. What can I do? Uh, initially, given that the noise variation has been issued, you will contact the EMA for monitoring of the variation. Uh, you can also contact the nearest police station post. Uh, a noise variation does not affect the operation of the Summary of Offenses Act. Number four, I am affected by noise from my neighbor's stereo. Who can I contact? Once again, you'll contact the nearest police station. What is the procedure for lodging an objection for an event? Uh, you can call, email, or submit a letter to the EMA stating your concerns. The EMA can only address noise-related concerns. I'm having an event in a remote area with no neighbors. Do I need to apply for noise variation? Once the prescribed standards will be breached at the event, um, at the property line, a noise variation is required. Noise also affects animals, not just humans. So. Here we have a look at how uh, the complaints process. Right? So we have a number of, of methods by which you can submit a complaint. Uh, you can submit via letter, which can be dropped off or mailed to the EMA. Uh, you can submit a complaint via email, so complaints at ema.co.tt. You can also call the complaints hotline at 226-4362 or 4EMA. Uh, select option two for the complaints hotline. Uh, there's also a complaint form that can be filled out uh, online at ema.co.tt as well as uh, the form could also be provided to you at the help desk at any of the EMA's offices. Also, you can visit our um, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram for further information, as well as the EMA's website. Thank you.
Thank you very much, both Nadia and Matthew, for the, those very um, informative presentations. I think many people here have some more information about the noise pollution control rules with respect to what is under the EMA's jurisdiction and what the TTPS can do. Um, it was remiss of me before to mention that we are going to launch a poll. It's a very simple poll, four questions, and those questions will be launched. They will be popped up on the screen maybe about 10 minutes before the end, which will be 10 to 2. Um, you will have three minutes to fill out the poll, and then it will end. So as I said, it's a very simple poll. So now we go to the chats, and we're going to look at questions that have been um, addressed. So please forgive me if I'm turning from one spot to another, but I have to read the chat so that um, Nadia and Matthew uh, would be able to respond. Okay, so we have a question which is posed there. Um, is there any that demerit system penalties for vehicles carrying oversized speakers, which is one of the basic, basic Sorry, um, let me just do that again. Let me reread. Is there any demerit system penalties for vehicles carrying oversized speakers, which is one of the biggest noise contributors in Tobago? Would either Nadia or Matthew be able to respond to that question? I just want to let you know, if we don't have an answer right now, we will definitely ask you to um, put your question in the email address we provided, emawebinars at ema.co.tt. So we're just scrolling through to see what other questions are here. None just yet, which is brought, seems to be a positive thing because it means that everyone was able to understand the information provided in the presentations. Hi, Marcia. I'd just like to uh, provide an answer for the question uh, from Tobago. Yes. Um, the, the only demerit system only covers traffic offenses, so it wouldn't co cover the loudspeakers and uh, the speakers in uh, emitting sound. So it does not, um, it would only be traffic offenses. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. We're still looking for questions. This is very interesting because we really thought we would have a barrage of questions coming to us um, from all the participants that we have on Zoom as well as Facebook. Okay, um, we have another, we have a question here. Oh, this is the most interesting one. Please revisit why fireworks are not within EMA's mandate if it is regulated by your legislation. Would Nadia be able to take that question, please? I'll repeat, please revisit why fireworks are not within EMA's mandate if it is regulated by your legislation. The issue with fireworks is that it's of big nature. It's an instant sound. So when the fireworks is discharged, um, the sound, the sound, cannot monitor the noise to um, establish a view. Um, so the EMA's next webinar, the results of the fireworks survey will address fireworks in further detail. Okay, Nadia, thank you very much for that. And I'd just like to add that we do have um, a survey which is up on both the website and our Facebook page right now. I had mentioned earlier that you have two more, I believe, two days before the deadline. So you can look at that survey and, um, you know, complete it so that we'll have more to talk about 
on the next day of the webinar, which will be on the 25th of August. So we have another question here. Are there any plans to address underwater sound impacts? Are there any plans to address underwater sound impacts? This point, um, no, there are no immediate plans to address underwater noise. Um, it is within the CEC process, it may be addressed within an EIA. Yes. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Question again, is there any specific place in newspaper where noise variation advertisements are placed? Or is this something we have to search throughout the newspaper for? There's no specific place in the newspaper where you have to place your notice. Um, it is up to the person placing the notice where they, where they want to place a notice um, that's an arrangement between them and the newspaper. Most notices are placed in the classified section. Um, the notices, the PME notices, you can also contact the information center, the EMA's information center, um, if you do not see a notice for a particular event that may, you may be aware of. Thank you, Marcel. Thanks, Nadia. Yes, in the information center, we have all the newspaper clippings that are relevant to environmental topics, so you can actually see a copy of where that um, newspaper clip, newspaper, the variation, sorry, was placed in the newspaper. So if you don't see it there, you can always um, call our information center. And of course, based on COVID restrictions, um, you call to make an appointment first as Nadia mentioned in her slide. Um, there's a question again. Currently, noise limits, base and via noise variations, are spe specified in decibels. Can consideration be given to specifying limits in decibels? The latter takes into account the disturbing deep base that emanates from FET. Yes, um, currently, the C um, with regard to monitor noise and they use the standard. The C weighting, um, yes, we have considered the taking into account the base that is, um, you know, it's characteristic of the music we have in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, perhaps when we are looking at revision of the rules, we can explore that further. Thank you, Nadia. Um, when I called the Faisabad police station regarding noise emanating from a bar, they would visit the bar and respond to me that the bar owner says that his noise is not loud and they don't have a device to measure loudness of sound. Please advise. And good afternoon, Marcia. This is um, Police Constable Charles here trying to respond to that question. Um, again, I want to emphasize that any police officer can respond to noise under the Summary Offenses Act. Um, there are stipulations based in the Act that the police officer can address the noise issue without an instrument. Okay, thank you, PC Charles. Um, PC Charles is from our environmental police unit, the EPU. Um, and they, of course, are special reserve police who are on secondment, um, appointed by the Commissioner of Police, and they work with the EMA with respect to our legislation. Okay. 
Okay, there's another question. We have some problem in Tobago, lack of monitoring devices. Um, would anyone care to respond to that question? Because it's not really clear. Um, we have a problem in Tobago. Is it the TTPS in Tobago? I think that the... Uh, the oh, she's asking too, is there an EPU in Tobago? Yes, there is an EPU in Tobago. And they are attached to the EMA's office in Tobago. So we do have a presence in Tobago as well. Thank you, Matthew. Can consideration be given to posting the approved noise variations on your website or Facebook page? At present, one can visit your office to view the variations, clippings from the newspaper, which is great but it would be so easy to just post these electronically so that anyone can be aware of any impending threat in their area. The EMA is currently looking at um, an electronic register. You would see on our website, we already have um, something where you can search for CECs and um, we are we are ex we are planning to do this for the other permits as well. So that is on stream. So here's another question. When I went to the bar around the corner in St. James, which is opposite the police station, the police say they cannot do anything. Sometimes the bars bring trucks on the Western Main Road that shake the buildings around. The police say they cannot do anything because they have variations from the EMA. What can I do then? Marcia, I'll take this one. Um, I believe that under the Summary Offenses Act, it clearly states that the, the police have the primary jurisdiction when it comes to noise, especially from the trucks on the Western Main Road. Um, I think in that case, what needs to be done is that the, the police, when you contact the police station, you need to remind them of the Summary Offenses Act. Um, in the case of the bar itself, well, what, a complaint can be submitted to the EMA, and the, the bar itself can be monitored. However, for the trucks and the mobile sources of noise, uh, the EMA does not have jurisdiction over those types of um, sources of noise. Therefore, the uh, St. James Police Station will be the primary uh, responder to that. In the event that they aren't, uh, they say that they can't do anything, again, uh, you might need to remind them of the summary, summary of Offenses Act, which is something that they are responsible for enforcing. Um, can I just add here that having a noise variation does not um, prevent the operation of the Summary Offenses Act. Um, it, the Rule 27 of the Noise Pollution Control Rules states, as we as we pointed out in our presentation, that nothing in these rules affects the operation of the Summary Offenses Act or the common law regarding nuisance. Okay, thank you very much to um, both Nadia and Matthew for those um, responses. We are just awaiting another question. When a location applies for a noise variation, it is common practice for EMA to contact neighbors to find out their views on the proposed event prior to granting the NV or noise variation approval. I have seen instances in the past where EMA did contact neighbors and took their views into account and other instances where you did not. Right. Oh, Marcia, can, I can take that question. So the EMA relies on uh, the public notice, the EMA notice that appears in a newspaper. Um, mm -hmm. However, if you 
anybody who contacts the EMA with a concern about an event, you know, and we have received a noise variation application, we can take your concerns into consideration. So whether or not you see the EMA notice, if you are aware of a, um, an event that's happening, you can call the EMA um, to, to find out whether or not an application has been received. If it has been received, we would take into account your concerns when we are making a determination of the application. If a noise variation has not been received, we, um, our EPU can, um, you know, provide some assistance or we would, we can liaise with the TTPS as well. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Um, while we await another question, just for your information, um, you can, our website is very dynamic. Um, you can go there and find information. Um, there are brochures on the noise pollution control rules, frequently asked questions. There's also information there, frequently asked questions on noise. And you can also find a brochure on environmental complaints, which is very comprehensive because it tells you about most of the complaints we have in both Trinidad and Tobago. There's a specific brochure for Tobago because some of their complaints are a bit different. And it tells you the agencies, organizations, um, government um, bodies whom you can address your complaints to. So please feel free to visit our website to get that additional information. Are there any more questions? I thought we would have been bombarded by questions this afternoon as a result of the topic. In response to uh, uh, the question seen uh, here regarding the reminding of the police stations of the Summer of Defenses Act um, on advice from the EME, um, uh, they said that they can't determine the loudness of sound. Uh, that will fall as well under the um, common law um, of nuisance as well. The police will have jurisdiction in dealing with the nuisance overall. It doesn't necessarily need to be within, within or outside of the prescribed uh, noise levels. It can sim sim simply just be a, a nuisance to the surrounding residents and the police can take uh, necessary action under the Summary of Offenses Act. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, while we await another question, um, probably Nadia can just go through a little bit more about the application for a noise variation um, each step, because I know some members of the public may not be aware or may get a little confused when they have to go through this. So if you can do that, Nadia, we'd be extremely grateful. Sure, Marcia. So the first step would be the placing of the EMA notice in the daily newspaper. As we mentioned in the presentation, this has to be done at least 35 days before the date of the event. The deadline dates for both the placement of the notice in the newspaper as well as submission of the application to the EMA are available on the EMA's website. So you place your notice in the newspaper. There's a specific format that needs to be followed. Um, the information in the notice includes 
who is proposing to host the event, the location of the event, um, the time, the start and end time of the event, as well as the date of the event. So that has, been, has to be placed for two consecutive days in any one of the daily newspapers. Once that is done, the application needs to be submitted to the EME at least 28 days before the date of the event. The application has to be completed and it includes the completed application form, the notices which appeared in the newspaper, the receipt for payment of the fee, the application fee, an application fee for noise variation. For a single event, it's $250. For multiple events, it's one thousand dollars, and they, this fee has to be paid, has to be paid into the EMA's account at any branch of First Citizens Bank. Um, we also require a map to show us where the event will be held, as well as a copy of the applicant's identification. This can be either your driver's permit, your national ID card, or your passport. Now, just a note on the applicant. The applicant for noise variation application is the person who owns or manages the property where the event will be held. It may not necessarily be the same person who is actually having the event. So if you are renting a property, um, if you are, you know, you, you receive a property, uh, someone has lent you their property to use, that person is the applicant for the purposes of the noise variation application. Um, once you have all those documents in order, you submit the application to us. We now have an electronic um, submission. You can submit your applications to noise at ema.co.tt. Um, that can be submitted electronically to us. And, um, once that has been done, you would receive a confirmation that your um, application has been received. That is electronically, that is. Um, however, because of COVID-19 restrictions, the event noise variation application process has been temporarily suspended. Um, uh, that applies to events alone. If you are having an activity such as construction, etc., you are still free to submit an application to us. Yes. Great. Thank you. You. Yes, thank you so much, Nadia, for that explanation. Um, before I go to this question, I just want to let you know that after this question is answered, we will be launching the pool. So the question is for industrial estates garages or workshops? Does the EMA conduct inspections to ensure these establishments meet specific requirements or provide guidance to meet such requirements for noise? So under the CEC rules, these inspections are conducted into these sites. However, we uh, only really conduct inspections into sites uh, prior to establishment if an application was made or if a complaint was made to the EMA regarding a site prior um, that's being established. Uh, in the case of our emergency response and investigations unit, we conduct investigations based on complaints. Um, and in the case of the CEC unit and the permit monitoring unit, uh, investigations are conducted based on applications and, C and actual issued CECs. Um, with regards to noise, it will be a consideration uh, as a part of the CEC to ensure that noise is, is uh, managed. Um, when it comes to uh, industrial estates uh, and, and garages and workshops, depending on where they are. So if it's in an industrial estate, they will have uh, different uh, legislation that will also help govern that. So there will be whether or not they have a, um, a, a rental agreement for the industrial estate in, in the case of ETEC parks, um, with regards to garages and workshops, depending on zoning as well. So Town and country may also get involved in those um, in those types of activities as well, mainly because of the, they, they will determine whether or not that activity should be located in that area. As many in many cases, what happens is that they're located in residential areas. Um, what happens as well is that we want to um, also reiterate this: 
just because a, a garage is in a, in a residential area doesn't mean that the EMA will investigate and take necessary action. There are limitations to what the EMA can do, um, especially for garages and, and auto body shops and workshops that are, uh, that will, that are established prior to 2001. Um, other for sources, other courses of action that could be taken could be done through, as I said, town and country planning, as well as through the regional corporation, uh, which they do have the power under the Municipal Corporations Act to serve a cease and desist order for the, that type of activity. Uh, I have a question here. I'm about to end the pool. Just giving you a few more minutes. Okay, poll is ended now. Um, someone wants to direct the question. I would like to direct this question to the email because it is more relevant to the topic of the first webinar, but I have not received a response from them. So as the EPU is present, are there considerations to improve enforcement of the motor vehicles and Road Traffic Act Chapter 4850 as it relates to black smoke emission. I understand the challenges such as human resource and like the fireworks and like, oh, probably unlike, I think there was a typo there, the instantaneous nature in most cases, but this is a problem I observe on the roads. Um, that will be launching into our next webinar which treats with the survey on fireworks, but I'm not quite sure whether Nadia or Matthew, and we now have Maurice Wishart with us, one of our senior legal officers, and even PC Charles. I'm not sure which one of you would like to take this question because I see several responses coming from each of you. So perhaps um, PC Charles may want to say something and then I could probably turn over to Maurice Wishart to elaborate a bit. Present, good evening again. Uh, the issue of black smoke uh, emission from vehicles is, is one where I would, I would call what you would respond to as a, um, uh, hit and miss kind of situation where you, you don't always see the situation present. Um, there are instances where, where you do get a perpetrator with black smoke. Um, however, the issue of black smoke emission, it is a ticketable offense um, where any police officer, not only the environmental police unit, but any police officer can issue a ticket for black smoke emissions. Um, concerning improvement, I can't say that um, the environmental police unit have, have embarked on having a greater presence on the nation's roadways as, as it relates to those types of offenses. And um, you can look forward to seeing us much more often on the roadways as it relates to dealing with not only black smoke emissions, but also uh, even unsecured loads and, and all that, all those um, issues that tend to uh, be offensive. Okay, thank you, PC Charles. Um, we have another question. What is noise? How many decibel levels, I believe, at what distance? So how many decibels at what distance? I know for sure the police have no device to measure decibels. I don't know if these questions have been addressed already. Once I can take that question. Right. Noise is 
it, it's defined as unwanted sound. Um, for the EMA's purposes, noise, we have the prescribed standards of the noise pollution control rules. So um, where the EMA is concerned, anything that is emitted above those standards in the absence of a noise variation can be considered noise. Um, regarding how many decibels at what distance, the EMA looks at the property line. So with the general area at nighttime, nighttime being from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., the permissible, the prescribed standard is 65 decibels. Uh, the distance, um, the EMA's legislation doesn't look at distance, we look at property lines, right? Um, th those standards are applicable at the property line. Thank you, Nadia. We have time for just yeah. one more question. Marcia, I'd just like to elaborate as well oh, on that question. Thank you. Um, also, so under the Summary of Offenses Act, um, there is no specific um, parameter for noise. It simply just speaks to nuisance, uh, section 70 under the Summary of Offenses Act. It's not very specific to any particular noise level. It just simply speaks to a nuisance being caused by any member of the public at a particular venue um, or any type of property. So the police don't uh, exactly need a noise monitor or decibel counter to uh, determine a nuisance. Okay, Matthew, thank you very much. Um, if we have more, any further questions from members of the public or even staff who are following? Hi. Okay, so thank you for joining us. We are just about three minutes shy of 2 p.m. So I think we have worked within the time limit. Um, I would like to urge you to, or encourage you to join us again on the 25th of August, where we'll be looking at the survey um, questions, um, the responses on the survey of fireworks, which is still up. And you have two more days if you're interested in um, completing that survey. We also have uh, about three more webinars coming up, one on the CC process, the other will be on permit monitoring, what happens after permit is issued, as well as on the new revised water pollution rules. So we have quite a bit coming up apart from other little things. So thank you again for joining us. I would like to advise you to look at our website because it contains a lot of information and don't forget by tomorrow you'll be able to see this actual session on our website as well as our YouTube page. So thank you everyone and just a reminder to be safe, be healthy and please wear your mask. Thank you and have a good afternoon.